Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Huntsville, Alabama at Redstone Arsenal, one of the most historic arsenals in the United States Army. And we're here at the Space and Missile Defense uh, Command to talk to uh, Dr. Richard uh, Yaw, a retired uh, United States Army uh, colonel uh, who is the director uh, of uh, the Air and Missile Defense uh, Center here and also uh, the, the uh, chief of high energy laser uh, work here uh, at uh, the command. Sir, uh, thanks very much for the time. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, you know, we're here for obviously the uh, AUSA's annual Global Forces Symposium, but it's great. Uh, it was a much more ambitious uh, effort uh, to uh, take a look at the uh, MHEL uh, capability, the 3.0 version of uh, the uh, uh, the mobile experimental high energy laser system, which is a first of its kind vehicle, right? I mean, someday this is going to end up in an Army Museum, and you guys were going to do a shoot down test where you were going to use the 10 kilowatt laser, solid state laser on the vehicle to shoot down some drones for us, but unfortunately weather intervened. Talk to us about why this is such a significant vehicle in the history of uh, battlefield laser development. Well, as you said, you know, the name of the vehicle is the Mobile Experimental High Energy Laser an Experimental Pro Platform. This is actually the first time all of the components uh, of a high energy laser system, the, the laser itself, the beam control, the command and control systems, and all the power systems and thermal uh, uh, cooling parts uh, components have uh, all been integrated in a combat platform. That's uh, a platform relevant to uh, what uh, the combat formations in the Army today are using and are projecting to use in the near future. Uh, so really, uh, really from that aspect, it's very historic in, uh, in just the packaging of it. Uh, the other part of it is, um, you know, it's the first time we've had a chance to put a system together to, uh, to look at what tactics, what uh, you know, tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, the concepts of operations that the Army might employ uh, if and when a, uh, a uh, full-up uh, high-energy laser system is fielded. So, uh, so from those two aspects, this, this system has given us a chance to experiment uh, with components uh, to develop a, a high-energy laser system that, that soldiers can actually use uh, on the battlefield. Um, obviously, uh, the role of this is uh, first for drones and thin-skinned vehicles, but obviously the Army wants to expand this. Uh, you went from 5 kilowatts to 10 kilowatts. You want to get to 50 kilowatts. Talk, you know, but, but there's this sense with lasers that every five years is still only five more years away. But, but everybody in the laser field has been telling me that we're actually a lot closer to being able to field uh, actually working military uh, products. Talk to us a little bit about that, you know, what's next, how this plays into it, and how soon it's going to be before we have a battlefield capability that we, we can use not only against defending against thin-skinned targets, but obviously the guided rocket mortar, uh, which is uh, a threat, especially when you're considering an anti-access area denial environment, where the enemy can fire a lot of uh, stuff at you, and you're then on the wrong side of the cost curve, so beams of light actually become really handy. Yeah, they do. Uh, actually, um, so, the, so the concept here, is that this is a 10 kilowatt demonstrator. Uh, you're right, 50 kilowatts we feel like is kind of the entry level to, uh, to get to threats that really uh, we, we feel are impacting the soldiers of today and, today and tomorrow. Uh, we've demonstrated through other, uh, other experimental platforms that 50 kilowatts is enough to uh, track and to kill certain uh, you know, rockets, artillery, mortar uh, threats. Uh, so that's kind of the entry level for, for a, a tactically relevant vehicle. So that's where we're going with this vehicle. But you mentioned uh, it, it is an old saying that uh, weapon, uh, high energy lasers are the weapon of the future and always will be. Uh, I was I, that's what I was kind of alluding to a little yeah, bit. Yeah, uh, and it's kind of funny, but, but uh, now we really are on the cusp, as you said, uh, of being able to put some, some uh, good capability, high energy laser capability in the hands of soldiers. Uh, within the next three to five years. Uh, for example, this, this uh, platform right here will inform a follow-on uh, program to uh, use a striker vehicle just like this, put a 50 kilowatt laser on it, and demonstrate that uh, in a, in a combat-like environment at an installation here in an exercise uh, about the middle part of 2021. Uh, so that's uh, pretty soon, a couple years out. Uh, we've never been that close before to actually putting a laser combat system in the hands of soldiers. Uh, it's, uh, it's really extraordinary and it's a very exciting period. And that program is going to be the multi-mission high energy uh, laser that will be on the, um, the, the striker uh, body. Um, we know one of the 
key things is you're, you're taking an enormous amount of energy and you're converting it into light, but in the process you're generating an extraordinary amount of heat. Uh, so there are two um, questions. One is, one of magazine depth and portable power, right? How much power do you have to be able to shoot effectively? I remember when this was the tactical, many decades ago, the tactical high energy laser was a large construct in order to be able to generate the power, the capacitor banks in order to be able to do it. Now you've made that portable. So two part question, how deep is your magazine? Because obviously any commander wants magazine depth. And then the second question is, um, you know, how much farther do you have to go on a heat management standpoint, given you generate an extraordinary amount of heat in order to be able to use the weapon? Yeah, now lasers, uh, I think it's widely known that high energy lasers are somewhere around 20, 30 percent efficient. Uh, so if you want to generate 50 kilowatts of output, uh, that means you have a lot of heat that's getting extracted at the other end. Um, I don't want to get into specifics of the magazine depth and all that, but you know it, it all has to do with rate of fire and what you're trying to kill and all those things. But you know we kind of feel like uh, essentially this is going to be an endless uh, magazine. Um, so uh, I, I think that's uh, about, about what I want to say about that. But but uh, you know what we really want to get to is try to increase the efficiency of the laser so there's not so much heat you have to worry about, and then reduce the size and weight of the power and thermal management components so that they're just not so big and take up so much space. Uh, you know, reduce the size of the laser, maybe increase the power output. So there's, there's science and technology work to be done, but uh, we feel like uh, right now we're, we're at a point where we can give something meaningful to soldiers and, and they can use it. Uh, talk to us a little bit about where the state of the art is you know once upon a time i know that the united states army has has been a leader in laser um you know investment and technology development for very many decades but we have great power competitors both russia and china who are putting extraordinary amount of investment themselves in these kind of capabilities uh because you know hey you know if it's a good idea uh, and you can um, you know, you, you don't need million dollar missiles or thousands of dollar missiles, but $30 beams of light uh, effectively, which is what your target is. Talk to us about what the state of global play is in terms of the technology and where the United States and its adversaries stand in this field. Well, um, well, again, I don't think I want to get into specifics on that, but uh, you know, the open, open source kind of illustrates that, that uh, we aren't the sole holders of high energy laser technology. And there are other countries who are working it along, along with us kind of in parallel. Uh, we do collaborate with our allies, um, and uh, you know we're all sort of tracking the same targets, I guess, so to speak. Uh, uh, I won't I won't say uh, that I've noticed a whole lot of discrepancy, um, but I think sometimes the the, the uh, adversary set are different depending on on what country you're talking about. So uh, we're just trying to trying to track uh, how we can do against uh, our adversaries. And. And talk to us a little bit about how each of the military services are also partnering and cooperating. The Air Force, because of the Airborne Laser Program, did some extraordinary work on the mirror technology to make sure that you can get through the dense lower atmospherics, uh, particularly. Navy has been doing a lot of that work, has a laser deployed on USS Ponce in the in the Gulf. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about how you're working with each of the military services to get sort of the best ideas, collaborate, and actually mutually accelerate all of your programs. Yeah, we uh, we are collaborating very highly with all the other services. You know, we we all uh, we have sort of different problems, right? So the Air Force is uh, trying to try to employ, employ lasers from aircraft, and they're shooting through the atmosphere downward. Uh, we're generally speaking on the ground, trying to shoot through the atmosphere either uh, line, either uh, horizontally or upward. So the atmosphere does different things to the lasers depending on on how you fire through them. The Navy, on the other hand, if if you're talking about a ship-based laser. Uh, the nautical environment is vastly different from what we would encounter, say, in, in uh, the deserts of uh, the Middle East. Uh, so from that, that perspective, we can kind of learn off each other, but we're, we're trying, to be, trying to address different problems. The lasers are the same, uh, fair, pretty much. Uh, so we're all going after similar objectives in uh, size, weight, and power. Uh, generally speaking, the beam control systems are the same. So there, are, there are aspects that we can collaborate on, and we're doing that uh, very well. You know, I was uh, traveling in a meeting uh, two weeks ago where all the services were together, talking from a common perspective on the parts of the problems that we can solve together. Uh, 
from a, a lower atmosphere uh, perspective, um, are all of those challenges, whether for particulate matter or for you know humidity, clouds, rain, and all of that, has all of that basically been sorted out at this point? Because you know that was historically always used as a case that well you know that's going to be a limiting uh, piece of the technology and why we need kinetic systems as well, whether guns or missiles. Well, uh, there's there's work to do. Um, for, to a large extent, we've done some of that work with lower powered systems. Um, and so now that we have higher energy lasers uh, developed and usable, we need to get out there and do, and do some more data collection and understand more fully what happens with a higher, higher powered laser uh, in those same atmospheres. The, the, other, the other part of it is uh, a lot of times we understand how the laser inter interacts with the atmosphere, but we can't really predict what the atmosphere is going to be in any, on any one occasion. Uh, so we have some modeling and simulation work to, to uh, get to that problem. And last question. Um, you know, when you said uh, that your goal is, is $30 per shot, I mean, that's that's an extraordinary target. I mean, and we're not saying that this is the same, for example, as a standard missile, but that's a multi-million dollar uh, weapon, for example, and same with that or, or with, with Patriot. Um, you know, talk to us what kind of step change we're talking about with the mass fielding of systems like this, lasers like this, that really would change the dynamic calculus of what future warfare looks like. Yeah, we're not really comparing with, uh, you mentioned some some ballistic missile defense, uh, uh, some uh, strategic level missile defense systems, we aren't really uh, assessing against those, but it, in terms of Army air defense, uh, depending on what particular air defense system you're talking about, the cost per shot could be several hundred dollars up to several thousand or a million dollars, uh, depending on the capabilities of, of the particular system. Um, like you said, the goal for a high energy laser system is to come in at about $30 per shot. And that's roughly speaking uh, the amount of fuel it takes to, uh, to store enough power to fire the laser. So uh, I've heard things like a cup of diesel or something like that. And, you know, at, at Army fuel prices, that equates uh, about right. So um, that, that's a pretty, uh, pretty big incentive to pursue these things. Dr. Yaw, thanks very, very much. Uh, best of luck on the program. It's, uh, it's really incredible to see a vehicle like this. Thanks very much for spending time with us. Thank you. Thanks for coming.